you again for, this is the first time, like I said before, of doing two sessions. So thank you so much for hanging out. Um, let me first ask the obvious question. Is this good? Is this uh, second two sessions pretty good? Just show a hand real quick. Everybody cool with that? All right, so we'll just keep doing two sessions then. Uh, this is a first part out of three, right? I plan to do three sessions. Right, and this is Michael Murphy. Uh, what's the official title that we want to call you? Senior <laughs> Architect? Senior Solution Architect. Okay, right, yeah. And he's been with us since the beginning. Like uh, last year at Tech Tuesdays, that's where I got to meet Michael. He was one of the audience members. He's like, hey, whenever you have time, I want to do a little presentation. And right off the bat, he, he presented about HP Cloud. And at the time, you were looking for people, and I guess you guys are still looking for people, right? Ge generally, constantly hiring. Yeah, yeah. they're constantly hiring. So if you guys are interested in this, I encourage you to learn more about it because this is highly applicable to the industry, and I'm sure he's going to tell you about that too. Um, I'll be in the presentation. I mean, uh, listening to the presentation because this I'm interested in as well. Uh, this is an awesome space. This is the feature. So uh, this is Michael Murphy. Hi guys. Let's welcome our shooter. <laughs> Okay, to start, I'm not a big PowerPoint guy, uh, so I'm not going to bore you with PowerPoint slides and marketing and mumbo jumbo. Um, I come from a tech background, uh, so my history, I grew up here in the valley, uh, some, some of the same place as all you guys were. Uh, I went to SCC, I went to Pan Am, um, kind of dropped out, did my own thing, went towards San Antonio, eventually landed at a place called Rackspace, uh, and that's where I got involved with a project called OpenStack. I was on the Alpha OpenStack Inception team. Um, who's here familiar with Amazon? AWS has used Amazon before. Okay, well that, that helps. Amazon's infrastructure as a service. Uh, it also has a PaaS layer. We'll, we'll talk about that in a second. But So I uh, worked with Rackspace for five years. I was on the alpha inception team of, of OpenStack, which is a hypervisor. Who knows what a hypervisor is? What's a hypervisor? It, it, it allows you to kind of bring up a, a whole server. So you can have uh, basically virtual machines. Right. So what's an example of one that people might have used before? Oracle, VMware. Right. VirtualBox, Oracle, VMware, uh, Amazon WS. These are all hypervisors. They use different ones. So usually you're going to be talking about um, a few in the States. There's Azure. They have their own proprietary uh, hypervisor. You have AWS, again, for, uh, proprietary. VMware, again, Oracle. Um, and then you have OpenStack which has, which is open. So someone asked me lightly before, what was the difference between Azure and what HP Hellion is doing? Oh, Hellion is a broad category for many of the product offerings that HP has, and they're all cloud related. So I work for the HP Cloud uh, team specific, but we're talking about um, private cloud, public cloud, infrastructure as a service has. Specifically, what I'm talking to you guys today is something called Dev Cloud. And we'll, we'll dive into that I've got a lab ready for you guys to use. We're going to keep this open and available for the continuing future. Um, really what the goal of, of HP, I, I'm like one of a very small amount of people that work this far south for, for Hewlett Packard. And what our goal is, is we have an evangelism, uh, an evangelism effort toward um, doing more and getting more developers involved with uh, HP Helium uh, and the dev platform product specifically. But that, that difference here, between a list of proprietary, you know, known um, hypervisors and OpenStack is that OpenStack is an open uh, technology, meaning anybody can contribute to the source code, anybody can read the source code. Um, it's used, the two predominant players in that space right now uh, in public cloud are HP and Rackspace. And in private cloud, there's a couple other providers such as Mirantis, IBM, Hewlett Packard, Dell, Ubuntu, Red Hat. Uh, so you have a lot of people that are paying attention to this strategy because these are very pricey. And again, who's used Internet Explorer in the last five days? <laughs> okay. uh, who's used Firefox in the last five days? Who's used Google Chrome in the last five days? And it's the exact kind of a terminology that we're really talking about as an open platform as opposed to a proprietary platform. We all know that Internet Explorer used to have market share. It lost it because it didn't stay open, it didn't adapt to the needs of developers. And that's where it lost out in the race of use, at least in the younger market, in the developer market. Um, so if you guys, just at this point, um, I don't know if it's going to, I have one user provision. So if you've got a, a laptop open, let me know and try, you just want to hit this web address, and it's going to ask you for a user password and use these two credentials. 
and let's see, just tell me if multiple people can get logged in. And then I'll, and then I'll, I'll basically introduce the product I'm talking about today. Okay. Working on it. We'll see the second person gets logged in. <laughs> You'll get a security error, you should just have to like hit the advanced proceed to APL. Yeah. Or is there's nothing gonna happen? Huh? Move your chair. about it a little bit. Anybody who's interested in using it as a uh, as a, dev a development platform, just go ahead and get with me and I'll provision you a user. Is it, is it like EC2 that Amazon has or is it more like... It is and isn't. And so... <clears throat> it is like an EC2 or not? So EC2 is... And I'm going to erase this because it's not going to be useful to us anyways. <coughs> so what is, what is EC2 first? EC2 is infrastructure as a service. <laughs> which that means that it's just easy to provision individual VMs, right? So you can use EC2 and you can provision VMs, but they're blank, right? So all you get at the start of that is an operating system. Ubuntu, um, Windows, CentOS, you know, whatever you have. What I'm talking about today is, is different. <clears throat> so this is infrastructure as a service. What we're talking about today is a platform as a service, which is taking this and removing the installation steps in order to get a working development environment, right? Because all you have is the OS, so you have to install Apache, MySQL, PHP, um, Redis, file systems, any number of individual services underneath on top of that OS so that you can just get WordPress installed, right? Because to have WordPress you need Apache, MySQL, and PHP. Um, Platform as a service is deploy WordPress. It's one button WordPress deploys, Jenkins, Joomla, at the beginning. Then it's, I'm developing applications, right? So <laughs> you can develop applications for a myriad of different platforms. And when you start developing, that's kind of what you think of. Well, what, what infrastructure is it going to live on? Is it going to live on Amazon? Is it going to live on VMware? Is it going to live on Apache? Is it, is it, where is it going to live? And depending on where it's going to live, it changes your development strategy. What Platform as a Service tries to do at the, at the very upper layers is allow you to take what's called a YAML file. And this is this big, mysterious, you know, difficult concept, but it's basically just taking your normal code, so you have blah 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 code, this is your web code, and you've built a web application, but to deploy that application you have to go and get a server and, and, uh, and underlining deploy the services that are needed. But in a YAML file, it just basically adds an extension of saying, well, I need MySQL, Apache, Redis, and Hadoop in order for this application to work then all that information is contained inside of one development file. So is this like the phone gap between the iOS and the Android? We haven't really gotten into that, that mobile talk or whatnot. Now, as, as you have to understand, I come from a very infrastructure kind of environment, and I'm still trying to investigate if this is going to be cross-platform for both uh, Java develop, like for both Java-based mobile development as well. Um, and I'm interested to find that out, but I really haven't figured out if it closes that gap. We're predominantly talking about web application, right? Okay. Um, <laughs> in this web application, though, instead of saying provision servers, 
right? Because this is this is ops right here, all this piece. This is all operational. And then after that layer, there's a there's a layer that's development, right? So you need all of this done before you get to development. This is DevOps. This is doing both at the same time without either of them uh, independently existing, right? <laughs> so to kind of further give that a uh, an example, this is a one portal kind of a one portal application and this is called HP Helium Development Platform and I'm going through a list and, and because the projector or the, the resolution is is down but has anybody worked with Drupal before? Has anyone installed Drupal at all? No? What, what goes into installing Drupal? How, how, how long did it take you? Well I remember what, like 10 minutes? 10 minutes? Okay. How many steps do you think were in that uh, 10 minutes? Question. I got the one that everything was already. Oh, you did an all in one. Okay, that's fine. So I'm on step two for this uh, Drupal install. One checkbox, deploy application, and aside this error that's randomly going to pop up. <laughs> the yeah. demo uh, got. But basically, uh, I haven't tested this one. I haven't tested Drupal apparently. Uh, we'll go with uh, We'll go with this Hello World node. It will work with Windows Stack. Uh, yeah. <coughs> so Windows is a, is a proprietary operating system, but the development on top of it, it is fine. So the concept is, is you have one YAML file, right? And you're developing a Windows application. You can develop that application in ASP um, or whatever, Windows like .NET, C. <coughs> you can tie your services, such as MSSQL or IAS, whatever services that are needed. And then when you push that application, it'll push it to a, uh, it's, it's, it's what's called a container. Do has anyone heard of Docker before? No? Docker? Okay, so what cloud, so lots of terms I know, they're coming together, but, but what Healing Development Platform basically does is it takes Cloud Foundry, which is, the develop is a new style of development, um, which uses Docker containers, right? Which allows you to kind of overlay and get behind the steps of individual microservice deployments, such as MSSQL, IIS, um, Apache, MySQL, and, um, and it simplifies that, because the server knows how to deploy them over and over and over again. <laughs> and when you take, whereas opposed where in IaaS, if you wanted to do redundancy, not only do you just have to configure this one server, you have to configure multiple servers and then configure load balancing and failover in HA. Whereas in PaaS, all you really do is define your HA policies in the YAML file, and then the PaaS layer takes care of it. And what it does is it takes, it starts a cluster, a larger cluster, it takes 10 servers, and it makes all of them containers, and all of them have the base services already loaded on them, so that any any time you push code to it, it just knows, okay, well, you need to go to a container with MSSQL as opposed to a container with MySQL. So it's mini SQL clusters with all the microservices already configured to take your operational time basically down to zero. So, it does, but it doesn't matter. Linux, I mean, it, whatever the underlying OS doesn't matter. No. Sorry, let me get back to here. Okay. So, in just coming back to where I'm at here, these are the list of applications that I have, and apparently they've used up uh, all the memory in my account, which is fine. Has anyone used Jenkins before? No. Again, with the thing, it's continuous integration. It's a it's a really cool app. Um, we'll talk about that more in, in session two and three. Um, let me just go ahead and delete this service so that we have room to deploy another one. I know that in AWS, you have to kind of like prep the environment by saying, I need, a, I, need a, I need an instance with so much gigabytes, an instance with so many uh, memory. And is this the same thing in, in Helion and uh, Helion that you have to do? Or If you were going to compare it directly to AWS, you'd be comparing it directly to Heroku. Oh, OK. 
So this is this is basically it, it is the, the same type of product. Heroku is a, a pass. Healing development platform is a pass. It's based off of open technologies and it can be deployed in both private and public infrastructure, whereas Heroku can only be deployed in private infrastructure. So this is the development environment, like one step configuring everything in the background, right? Mm -hmm. So you can get coding like real quick. How, how hard is it to take it from the development environment to production and about the scaling? Does it handle the scaling on its own? Scaling is handled all by the, all by the container by, services. By the container services? It just spread, adds, spread. More, it adds more infrastructure underneath the containers and then says, okay, well, at, at that point, then we'll, we'll provision more. Um, it's it's cluster-based management. You can also configure, because it, it, it gets down into how many load balancers do I have, how many routers do I have, how many file systems do I have. In the in the actual container code deployment, you specify what HA layers that you want, and one and two and three, how many file servers, what type of load balancing, and then the applicate of the containers themselves and the healing development platform, which is based off of Cloud Foundry, um, then takes care of that HA. So we'll, we'll, when I when I show you one of these uh, applications already running, like I'll I'll, I'll set dashboard, I, I will set uh, Jenkins to. Uh, Michael, I have a quick question. Go ahead. Uh, so, I'm not a software uh, engineer guy, I'm a business guy. Mm -hmm. And I'm working with a software uh, company to build an app. How can uh, P Helion help me? Uh, I know a couple of the things that I've mentioned earlier is the things that the software company has mentioned to me, like EC2 as servers for the development uh, will, will grow with my application. How can Helion help me? Why do I need Helion? Do I need Helion? Okay, so so uh, again, EC2 and Healing Development Platform aren't a direct comparison, right? Okay. Because we're talking we're talking about that's just if you're going to talk about the value in the difference between in, in, infrastructure as a service and develop uh, and platform as a service. The value add there is skipping steps and auto scaling, right? Because you can't as as infrastructure as a service, every piece of this is managed, and every piece underneath it can break. It's not self healing, right? So. In an infrastructure as a service environment, when you have one node die, the typical recovery process from that is you start individually troubleshooting that node because because it's and, expensive. Right. Yeah. And, and in a platform as a service node, it's set up to be so redundant and so scaled out that it basically just discards that node and continues on um, because it's already scaled. It, it was already configured to, to handle a certain amount of failures. Kind of like rate. This is the same concept of RAID being there from the beginning, or RAID not being there from the beginning. So it was already redundant by the time you started using it. So if you lost a single VM, it doesn't really affect you. In infrastructure as a service, losing one VM is a big deal. Platform as a service is not a big deal. So from a business perspective, the loss of operation time, the loss of you know the the considering the troubleshooting, break fix, that that kind of an area, um, that's your business value add of why you use platform as a service instead of infrastructure as a service. When you get into, well, why use Heroku, why use a healing development platform over Heroku, because those are two direct competitors, um, then we get into the pricing of Heroku. Heroku is a great, uh, it's a great place, and healing the same Cloud Foundry base is interoperable. And <laughs> what I mean by that is, if you wrote an application for Heroku, which is very common these days, but you didn't want to deploy it onto Heroku, you can take that same build pack and deploy it onto any Cloud Foundry compatible uh, container. Right? So IBM Bluemix, Helium Development Platform, anything that basically supports Cloud Foundry, you can push it uh, via that. And more and more development is going toward this style of, yeah, uh, this style of development push because, again, you are starting to become agnostic of the underlying infrastructure or on the underlying platform here you're done yet. So you don't have to retool, you're not gonna have to refix it. And the concept all comes back down to this, uh, this big word, another buzzword, in the way, which is uh, TSCA. That's the, the Open Cloud Standards and Certificate Organization. I don't have the, the actual definition by words, but what it means is that with cloud and cloud technologies, um, there is a standards organization there called TSCA who is trying to unify what everybody is individually doing and bring it back together. So you don't have organi or you don't have situations like with Amazon when you've done all Amazon development, you've developed around an EC2 API. Right. At that point, when Amazon becomes more expensive than say Rackspace or HP, 
you are so stuck in the proprietary development of, of Amazon that once a competitor comes out, it's like being locked to Roadrunner for life, and then Google Fiber comes out, and you can't go to Google Fiber because your computer won't work anymore. It's the exact same thing. So now the industry is kind of saying, let's come back, let's slow down, let's come to an industry standard that says, if we develop in this space, in this cloud foundry, standardized space, and we allow for ourselves to stay agnostic of the, the platforms that are underneath, then we won't ever have a, a, a time again where we're worrying about value add or what platform's gonna be underneath this because it changes. One day Rackspace is better than, than somebody else. One day HP is better than somebody else. And, and the value of business is being able to move across those platforms. And that's what Helion can do for me. Absolutely. That, that's what <clears throat> platform as a service can do for you. And Helion, Helion is a platform service. Platform as a service, absolutely. Okay. So and then, I can do EC2 underneath Helion. Um, you can do... Yes, because if you've developed YAML, you can go, you can push it to Heroku, or you can push it to Dev Platform. So if one day you decide that you'd rather have your business over here, you don't, you don't have to, you don't have to change your development strategy. You don't have to rewrite code. The code, the, the code doesn't change. It's just your choice of where to deploy the code changes. That, that stays true. Um, Helion doesn't make it work on Amazon. You, as the service provider, you as the deployer, decide where the code is going to live. But in order to do that, you have to do this new style of IT, new style of development, where the code is standardized. Otherwise, you're always going to be retooling your code. And until we get to that kind of base code standard, we're always going to be refixing our code, or retooling our code, or rechanging our deployment strategies based on what new thing comes out. And everybody's kind of tired. Um, so this is kind of the message in between uh, why go to a Tosca why go to a Cloud Foundry-based development strategy is instead of just kind of throwing darts at the wall and trying each new thing as they come along. What kind of developers are using Helium right now? Because I, I know that .NET is not ready for containers. I mean, they're barely beta testing that mm -hmm. in Visual Studio 2015 to making sure that the JSON has all the required, especially the .NET, because right now the .NET has to be on the server. Absolutely. Uh, but right now they're testing that uh, Docker and stuff like that. But what right now the ones that are already using Helium, what kind of developers are those? In your the the traditional de uh, developers that were already working across the LAMP stack, um, startup. HP. Yeah, a, a lot of enterprise developers that have seen the problems of. Let's imagine you're an, you're if you were an enterprise IT buyer, someone who is in charge of enterprise purchases. Uh, Across the board, you would look at maybe five or six different technologies that you've bought in the last 10 years. Whether, uh, and that's just what you've made the purchase as. And that doesn't really mean what your developer is using. We're, we're, there's a concept called shadow IT right now that the higher ups and the purchase managers are disconnected from the actual development layer, um, where they'll go out and they'll buy a, a, a $250,000 VMware cluster, and they'll give that to their employees to use. And their employees will say, that's cool, I'll just go expense EC2 on my, on my you know, expense card and I'll get my platform up there because I don't want to use this technology because it, it's uh, bulky, it takes me time to get the server, um, my boss is giving me a deadline and I can't use that, it's incompatible with this, you know, with this technology. So in that sense, enterprise is coming to, hey, let's, let's look at how we can kind of get to one standardization so it doesn't matter where it lives, so whatever system we bought, it's going to plug in and work. Um, as well as your traditional startups, uh, hackathons. We just sponsored a hackathon in San Francisco uh, last week, so we had 78, you know, 80 different developers working on the project, uh, using it. We're, we're in a very evangelical state right now where we're promoting the product, we're talking about a product, we're trying to get it out there. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, no, I mean, I mean, but that. Well, because what I want to know is, I, I know what we do is not ready for something like this, and what I'm interested in is in, in, in uh, languages like Node.js and Ruby on Rails. Uh, have you seen those guys, those type of programmers, pushing stuff to Helium, or are you just seeing PHP, the lab stack? Both, uh, aside, uh, .NET is in the developmental stages and the beta stages, but Ruby, Python, uh, Node.js, Java, okay. C, uh, PHP, I mean, anything else, it has been used. I, I have an account on, on, on Azure, and I kind of want to look at this to play with Node.js and Ruby on Rails. Uh, and I just want to make sure that that was available. 
Okay. Oh yes, yeah, yes, absolutely. I mean, I'll, I'll show. We'll we'll get together and after after kind of the presentation, I'll show you individually. Um, but I mean, yeah, the the language support is vast right now, and it grows kind of every day. I'm gonna go ahead and delete this one out just so I can push it again. Um, the one that I just pushed right now, and this is just a Java environment, and I know it's not very simple, um, but <laughs> what basically happened is it took a YAML build file and it said, push me a Java environment. So it kicked up into a container um, that already had the Java dependencies installed. It put a hello world piece of uh, information in that Java container, uh, started the Java service, and then created a DNS entry that then just gives me a simple link to be able to go to my application. We're gonna do the same thing with a more complicated app called Jenkins right now. Uh, to, go ahead. Um, this is the deployment, uh, what you showed us, this is the deployment platform, correct? Correct. Uh, what about the development ID? Yes, it has a plugin. Uh, so, uh, how do you use Eclipse before? Eclipse? Yeah. Eclipse, as an ID. Right, so, it has an, uh, an automatically integrated. Right, and it has Eclipse. it in there, you yes. check in, and it automatically it uses check in the auto deploy. Absolutely. Right, this is just kind of the GUI portal okay. to deploy. I'm gonna show you the CLI deployment methodology here in just a second. Um, I'm just kind of show, starting at the high layer and then yeah. come down to it. But I mean, as far as having a, a, an Eclipse plugin, absolutely, um, as well as uh, a CLI method of deployment. What's uh, Amazon's, uh, I guess, solution? Heroku has been, which isn't an Amazon product, it was an individual startup that was built using EC2. Um, and they took the, the basic, this YAML technology, and then what they'll do is, you take that YAML, it deploys the microservices, operates in the same way. The competitive difference is their scaling is very, very pricey. So it's free to develop and use on top of Heroku, which is, which is awesome. That's why developers all day long, if for a dev test environment, can go to Heroku and they can start work and they can get their, their prototyping done on Heroku very easily. The problem is, is that when they begin to scale, it's exponentially more expensive. And that's, that's how they make their money. They say, okay, here's a little bit, here's a little taste for free. It's really easy, My, you know, services are done. You don't have to install anything that you don't, you know, that you don't know how to do. If you don't know how to install Apache, that's fine. We'll do it for you. Just put the little dependency in your YAML file. That's fine. But once you go from dev test to production, we want, 80 to 90 percent more than what you would have paid if you had just individually gone and bought the VMs from EC2. So, and they've done that, and they, and that's how they've made their money, and that's and that's awesome. That's fine because that's the service that they provide. But <laughs> from a um, from a scaling and usability and what we would hope to see for you, uh, the cost of that has been you know pretty uh, has scared some people away from going full to, uh, full production off of what they've built on top of. I think on all of them he has, because I have Azure, and I have gone on Azure and done some stuff, and also on Heroku. Uh, and I've even had like nine websites on Azure. Mm -hmm. But once I put on a database and something that you can go and interact, you know, while before my average was like four or five bucks, as soon as I put a, a real web development uh, mm -hmm. stuff with a database, and I started getting hits, it's, it was like three times and that I had to shut it down because I said, what if I start getting hit a lot? It's going to be a lot of money. So, I mean, we're trying to find out something that is scalable, but it's not going to all of a sudden, I'm going to have to pay more than my life bill, you know, a month. This is a big divide between public cloud has its uses. We, we operate a, a very successful public cloud, um, but at certain points, the, the price points of public cloud, it's been shown to be cheaper up until a certain price cap, and then when your spend is above that, it would have been better to buy the hardware and build a private cloud in your own four walls than it would have over time. And these are some of the reports that we're trying to put inside of enterprises who, whose shadow IT spend, whose EC2 spend, whose public cloud spend has become exponential, and, and execs are starting to get these reports of like, well, why do I have a $450,000 EC2 bill from 16 different departments, and none of this is consolidated. Um, and, I, I, and, and what are we spending money on? What, what's being done? Are these servers being turned off in the right way? Are they being managed the right way? Are they auto-scaling the right way? Because there's no visibility into that. Um, now, Hewlett-Packard has a 
different offering that that talks about unification and that and that spend and it's it's very cost conscious but right now we're focusing on the development platform so we'll we'll get into that as a as an enterprise ceo or cfo how how to like how to handle your spend on whether public private um different platforms being used vmware uh, but for the intensive purposes, this is more developer based. Does it have any kind of like a <laughs> notification that, let's say, uh, I want to spend only 20 bucks a month mm -hmm. and it's saying it's getting there, you know, hey, I don't want to all of a sudden a week later find out that it got you're talking, you're a lot. spend throttle. And now I have like two or three hundred dollars that I need to pay for that. I would have liked to know that, hey, a PaaS will not have spend notification. A PaaS management layer, something like cloud system architecture or cloud system enterprise would. But that again, that's a different offering that we'll probably touch about, uh, talk, we'll talk about in the third day. Because again, we're, we're not talking about cost, we're, we're just talking about developer add-on. So but, if, if I have, let's say, created a, a Ruby on Rails app, let's say I'm Cloud9 and deploy to Heroku, how far am I from Using something like this. You can take a Heroku build pack, and let, let's say your, your spend is just ridiculous uh, in Heroku. You can take a Heroku build pack and day one come to the Helium development platform either by deploying it on public cloud or by buying a small Helium private um, installation, and you, you have to change no development to start. So we can go from Heroku to Helium? Yeah. The, it, it, cloud Foundry is it, it's basically using the same thing. It's called the Helium build pack. So that, that same YAML style. Now, I haven't seen every application use case, and I can't guarantee 100% absolute compatibility, but in all theories, in most testing, that, that format, there's, there's literally nothing to change. There, there may be a small dynamic. It may fail on the, uh, on the first build and say, you should add this service instead of that service, or the formatting might be wrong, but as compared to most development changes, going from one platform to another, I, I mean, it's, it's a night and day kind of difference. Okay. okay, so let me go ahead and see if this is uh, correctly loaded. So we had just basically pushed that, and I know that this is uh, this screen is, is limited by the, uh, the log store, but all of the log and application output, so we just basically told it, we looked at a, uh, we looked at a, a application directory, a list, of, uh, a list of apps that are publicly deployable, just from our, our, you know, our public repository, um, and we asked it to deploy the app. And it gives us a log of everything that the app did while it was uh, while it was deploying. This is all the Git checkouts, um, looking over the code. It deploys the microservices, updates the branches, checks your proxies, does all the information that you needed to do. So now at this point in stage, it's still prepping the Jenkins environment. It's still working, but within a few more minutes, Jenkins is deployed and fully usable where I didn't have to start a VM, I didn't have to install Apache, I didn't have to configure MySQL, I didn't have to create a database, I didn't have to set a connection string. All that information is pre-populated and done. And now, <laughs> with one button, I can start using Jenkins. To answer the question of what Jenkins is, Jenkins is continuous integration. Uh, I hope to start getting it used uh, in this local event. So, raising, who's involved in any application development for code RGB right now? Is anyone working on <laughs> so it gets difficult using the. I mean, Git is a great a great product. You know, check-ins, check-outs, looking at the code. Um, we hope to Jenkins is the enterprise. If you were to walk into HP Development's studio and lab right now, everybody uses Jenkins inside of HP Cloud Development. At least for HP Cloud, because that's the one I'm most familiar with. This is how we share development updates, stories, guidelines, the whole agile methodology. Um, check-ins, check-outs, code reviews, uh, code security verifications. This is the one kind of stop-shop management tool platform that we use to make sure that everybody's on the same page and that the code doesn't break every day. Um, so it's like it's, foundation? Excuse me? Like Git Foundation server? Yes. Yeah. A absolutely. Yeah. But more, more based on continuous integration, as I understand. And you have to remember, it's, it's odd when there's an infra, like because I'm a more Linux ops guy than I ever was a developer, I just know that all the developers use it and talk about all the crazy things that they do with it, and, and I'm very jealous about it. But So now the application's ready. They've just taken a second to get up. But again, we didn't have to define any individual credentials. We had to do no software installations, um, and it's up and running. 
which is pretty impressive because otherwise I click three buttons and otherwise that installation takes you know 40 45 minutes of actually being engaged time um, to get the to get a lamp server up and to get Jenkins installed on top of it. Um, now this is from a public repo. The, the the goal for developers such as yourselves is to enable you to do the same kind of thing. For you to write code once, be able to deploy it to any platform, be it Heroku, EC2, Healing Development Platform, Bluemix, doesn't matter. If, if you don't want to worry about where it's going to live at the end of the day, if you write it to a Tosca standard, if you write it to a Cloud Foundry standard in this kind of a format, um, you're going to be okay and you're not going to have to worry about will it live where I need it to live. Uh, and that's, that's kind of the goal. Now we talked about um, auto scaling earlier. So we pushed the application. We've, uh, we've viewed it, we've seen that it's working. Um, I'll show you an alternative uh, method in just a second. I just wanted to show the auto scale piece. Just a moment, because this screen is really throwing me off. going to disconnect the projector for a second and see if it Okay, so see here, um, as we deploy this instance itself, this is, it, the instance is sitting inside of one container at this point, right? So we built no HA into it. It has really no disaster recovery policies that are going into it. Um, I don't know who, who here has ever done uh, auto scaling before or um, any kind of HA planning for an individual application. <coughs> as again, that's more my specialty as an operations guy, and I understand most of the crowd here is development. Um, and this is what we talk about, the value of one DevOps guy versus one individual developer and one individual operations guy, right? So your operations guy, VCD me, we're in charge of, you know, the infrastructure underneath your environments, patching, scaling, troubleshooting, fixing, but we're, we're in charge of either LAMP or Right? So that's Linux Apache MySQL on PHP for the Linux environments. And, and then under Windows, it's Windows, IIS, MSSQL, and ASP. Right? So your, your admins, your operations guys, we're in charge of keeping these environments up, stable, scaling them, making sure we fix them when they break, making sure your code doesn't totally you know, crap out when you put it on top of it. And then your dev guys, you guys get to do the fun new products. Um, you get to do a little bit of hyperscale, depending. Um, actually, you know, make the cool web page or mobile application that has all the you know, pretty stuff that, that goes on. And that's fine. And these, these silos kind of operate independently of each other, right? And some of the problems that happen is that you guys write some code, and that code's cool, and then you push it to uh, the staging environment, and it blows up. The staging environment falls over on top of itself. We got we got managers calling us saying, "Oh my God, everything's broken." Blah 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 blah. The concept of development ops or having people think about operations whilst they write their code, deploy the code, um, we begin to 
to, to, to break the barriers that exist between these two development teams. Exactly. Right? To whereas before, if I as an ops guy was going to try to auto scale an application, you know, in, in say any type of like VMware, hyperstack, uh, you know, OpenStack environment, okay, so I got to provision a couple of AC, you know, VMs, multiple VMs. I got to configure HA proxy to make sure that the DNS requests get round robin to these individual VMs. I have to unify these VMs in some way, right? Because they all have to have the same amount of data, the same systems on it. So I, I'll use a MySQL database in order to try to keep all this data consistent and checked in. Um, and maybe I'll use some DNS as a service. Maybe I'll have a bunch of snapshots in the background, a bunch of clones or copies of this running system, so that if any of these pieces X out, that I can just provision these, start these, and then bring them into that cluster. It's a very complicated process, um, auto scaling. And that we're not even talking about like RabbitMQ, discovery, moderate metering, billing scaling, um, scaling the environment back down. A lot of a lot of auto scale environments that get built to work at scale are really good at scaling up, but they're really bad at scaling down. So the, the application can just go up and up as demand comes, but they're really poor as the demand drops, kind of bringing themselves back to the original shape that they were. And this matters for cost, because if your environment doesn't scale back down, um, you've got a lot of provisioned resources that you're paying for that you didn't necessarily need. Uh, auto scaling in development platform, you take this button right here, you move it there, you set a, a threshold for the CPU, and you hit save. Now, that application can auto scale. And it looks, it's very simple, and it's not as, uh, it's not as cool to do, I, I personally have more fun doing it this way. I, that's just because I enjoy that method. I like making a bunch of HA nodes and messing with the metering rules and scaling rules, but if my intent or goal was to make money or to get a project done quickly, I would much prefer to move a button to the right and say automatically scale that application up and down as it needs to be scaled. Can so, you have multiple environments? Let's say right now uh, you have PHP 2.2 um, development because you're working on, on upgrading it to 2.4. Mm -hmm. Is that what you put on the YAML that your development is 2.2? Your uh, uh, or your production is 2.2, your development is, uh, no, your production is 2.2, and your development is 2.4, because you're trying to make all the Absolutely. modifications. If you define it in the YAML that the dependency is a version, then when it pushes it, it'll create a container with that version inside of it. If you then, so it, it would just mean, it would just run independent containers, one with 2.2, one with 2.4. So and depending you push on the it, development and say, mm -hmm. I want to try it, you know, this development, and Right, as you saw when, when we pushed right now, a, a second ago when you saw me um, hit like a, I hit a, a, a category that said zones, right now I have this individually configured to just one placement zone because I made it earlier this morning. <laughs> um, but if I was trying to run a multi-tiered staging, you, traditionally you have dev, test and production. dev staging, staging test and then production. And then you move it through these three areas. Um, so you can create that within HP Dev Platform, you can create as placement zones. So when you come down into this thing, when you're pushing a thing, right here it just has one defined as default, it's not even droppable down, but basically you would have three different categories. So you would be able to push to dev test, staging, production. Um, and if you have a production app, some of the, and as I'm not a, a full-fledged member of the development club, um, but, as I understand, taking production, uh, going from staging to production gets a lot more simplified with the advantages that you have for Dev Platform because it can basically, what it does is it, let me walk you through a traditional, Dev to, uh, so when you go from staging to production, you kind of put production into maintenance mode bring it down, make whatever updates to the DB that you need to, replace whatever uh, Webpack content that you need to, and change your configuration files, 
install your new patches, whatever you have to do, and then you bring the environment back up. What you can do with, with uh, Cloud Foundry, with HP Dev Platform and Perform, is it basically will spin up a secondary environment, a temporary environment that's a clone of the first, just by popping in a new container, run that, keeping it live, while the DNS is pointed to it, so that all, all your users that are continually using the product are hitting that environment, while it then creates the new production environment, sets that up, you can then see that that production environment's working, and then flip the DNS trigger so that this becomes uh, active instead of the other one we call it, instead of the other one. So it's a seamless production update as opposed to your standard maintenance driven production, staging to production. Uh, does the DNS change once all the connection goes closed or like a reload the connection? It, it, like a, a the it basically spawns this new environment out, uh -huh. allows that environment to, it, it, it's, it's a form of self-healing. It allows that environment, okay, so depending on how many changes, I mean, you could have amazing, massive changes. You could be talking about like moving from PHP 5 to 6 or, or whatever else you're <coughs> needing. Um, it, it allows you to, to view this environment independently. So this, this environment is up, but no, no public, it has no, the databases <coughs> that are associated with this are not being affected by this, this staging environment. Once this environment is ready to switch in, it basically just reconnects to this database, flips the DNS from here to here, and then you're live. But what about the connections that I'm getting from the outside, you know, from users that I'm getting the over? It just starts moving them from the, the, shouldn't drop the connections from the MySQL server, it's just gonna start moving the new ones that come in. And since they, the old connections stay, it's not gonna like terminate that old DNS. Okay. So the old, the old DNSs aren't, aren't gonna drop. It's just gonna, the next time they come for a refresh, they're gonna get directed to the new DNS and they're gonna come into the new MySQL connection. So it's, it's effectively not gonna <coughs> drop anybody here. They're, they're not, it, it'll also do session, uh, like a lot of the sessions will be loaded like at the browser side as well. So it gives you that functionality. You had mentioned MySQL and a couple of other services relating with data. How does the Helion uh, development platform work with data? Because you have testing data, you have production data, and you have staging data. When you create these instances, these uh, containers, it's a separate data? And if so, how do you migrate data between two different locations? And how does that all play into all of this? So the underlying, because and, this, and I hate to throw so many new buzzwords at you guys, that are not buzzwords, but, but acronyms and terminologies. So HP Dev Platform, at its core, is coupling Cloud Foundry, which is this platform as a service layer that we're talking about, with Helion OpenStack. And that can mean two things. That can either be in a private or public implementation. Public meaning right now this demo is running on top of our public cloud. Um, so anybody could log into our public cloud, create a developer quick start trial, deploy the server, and then have access to this using all public resources, which is pay as you go, meter to build. Um, or we can talk about a public implementation, which is we bring in 15 racks, networking gear, you know, drop gear, and then again, the, the reasons why you would choose one or the other, a lot of that's regulatory or cost, or benefit, CapEx, OpEx, you know, lots of new acronyms and words that we won't get into too much. Um, so the, these are the two, con that's, that's what Dev Platform is. What Dev Platform uses as a storage engine is something called Trove. Um, and this is a relational database written for OpenStack. So at the end, all these containers are backed up into a Trove database, and then that Trove database can be replicated. So if you need to specifically get in there with like a MySQL tool, and make data backups of that database so that you have a data refined data refined backup. You can go in there and you can take care of that. Well, in particular, that's the biggest issues that I've had with developing and maintaining systems. Is that usually the configuration and installing of software? It's like whatever you know. You can always just recreate another instance, another OS. Mm -hmm. But data, you lose your data, and that's it, right? So I'm just wondering where the Helion, it, it, I, need, I need to learn more about Trove, but I'm, I'm trying to figure out if the Helion, you know, it's kind of like with the whole YAML packaging kind of thing, like if there's like this nice little, oh yeah, you, you put the data in the cloud in the Helion platform, then don't worry about it, nothing's gonna wrong, go wrong with it. You get automatic backups, you get um, backups per the hour, backups to the week, like, I don't know, d does that come in the configuration the files? Or? backup service, uh, that's a lot of what Trove does. Um, it does keep it, you still, 
So really the only thing that is any different, because you, you're going from this environment where that became a lot, like having MySQL backwards was really important, to really all you need now is, um, is the code itself. Now we're not, user data, billing data, all, all the you know, traditional stuff that gets stored into that database. You can still access that database via a standard MySQL management tool, MySQL workbench, you know, whatever you want to come in and get that drop back up down. Um, a lot of that, as long as that healing development platform does, it's usually running two copies of that database. Okay. Um, I haven't gotten into the innards of it, of like how, what the rate that it runs the backup of Trove is. Um, I, can, I can dive into that, but that's, that's <coughs> something. I, from my perspective, I've never really worried about that piece, because right. most of my stuff is death tests and staging, so I really don't care about the user data getting lost. Right. Um, but I'm you know, happy to jump into where that data retention is. Yeah. Right. Cool. Cool. All right. I know you said that you made a copy of the web server and uh, it was connecting to the database and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. then the other server just came in and reconnected to the database and it continued. But as developers, a lot of times, especially at the very beginning of a project, there's a lot of changes in the code that you create classes. You create new tables, new fields, new stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, migration of database data. Database migrations. How, how do you go and make the database modifications if, you know, we come down, we bring the application basically down because we don't allow any connections to the database while we're making While changes. it's locked. You know, I don't know how, you know, you can keep the database up when you need to make those. It clones the database and it keeps the old, like, it, it basically takes, it mirrors the database and it keeps a staff a container, which is just that, as it existed. It writes the changes uh, from that point. Then you've got your new environment that's being put up, being locked, you know, and it comes in, and it was the same data, you make the changes to that new environment. Then what happens is that new environment comes, on, uh, comes online, and it basically just, very similar to an rsync, where it just replicates the data that was changed from when they started to diverge. Okay. It populates that data back into the, into the tables, and then locks it down. Now, if you're doing massive, massive changes to the schema of the database where there are, you've now moved the categories where that data is being routed, then you, you still have the ability to put it into maintenance. Most times you won't need to do that, but if you need to drop everything, actually go into maintenance mode, change schema, and then come back up, you absolutely have the ability to do so. It's just if you weren't going to do that, if you weren't really, I, I see your point. If you're not changing schema, then you don't have to do that. If you are, you may still need to put it into me as well. Mm. Absolutely. Cool, cool, cool. And I don't, I don't want to go too much over time, and I know we've, we've kept you guys over here. I do want some time for Q&A, um, but we are going to, how am I going to get, I, I'm going to have to you know, provision for anybody that wants to, to it really, I can talk about it all day long. What we want you guys to do is start using it, and we want to start using it on, on code RGB projects, and that's, that's our, our intended goal. Um, it's not a huge, I know I talk very techy, I've worked a long time in the field, I, I like talking tech. It's not very, very difficult to get started. If you want to start a WordPress server, if you've never really even talked tech before, I've recommended it to a ton of people who just, hey, I want to put a web page up and I want to mess with that web page and learn how to use it. It's perfect for that use case and it's perfect for someone who wants to do continuous integration with not, you know, not having to worry about the hardware platforms underneath. So it's, it's good for, for both fields of the house. Um, I, this environment is gonna be up for the next you know, five, six months at least. Um, I will be the administrator of it. And if you want an individual login, all you have to do is come in and I'll be here for like the next you know, hour or so making logins for that. Uh, you can email Olmo and say, hey, here's, I just need an email and a username and a, a desired password. Once you get that password back, you can change it so I don't know it if you want. Uh, I will say, it's going to be a sandbox, so if you guys want to do something production, I totally encourage that, but talk to me about getting your own account and go in production, because if you're going to use this, you're going to play with this, you're going to either teach yourself to develop or start using it to develop in a new way, um, this environment will be, like someone might come in there and delete your app, so make sure you check your code to get, and you know, don't be upset, I can't control you know, if it's going to be a shared environment, I won't be able to control if someone comes in there and restarts your app or stops it or deletes it to make space for their own. Um, I will try to police it as best as possible, but it is very much a sandbox staging area. Um, if you want to go production, 
you can just take the code, talk to me, and I'll show you how to you know, set it up in public cloud or uh, anywhere else that it would make more sense to be stable for you. And then uh, with that, I'll, I'll complete, aside from any Q&A, if anybody still has any uh, you know, questions and answers, or questions. All right, then. Thank you guys so much. Appreciate it. Thank you.